Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second episode of the Paralympic Podcast. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have Noel Thatcher with us. Um, just before we begin our podcast, I'd just like to ask you all if you could keep your microphones on mute for the duration of the podcast. In the event that you are wanting to ask a question, we have two methods in which we can do so. Um, the first method is via our chat service on Zoom, um, which can be done by submitting your question there. And then I will invite you to ask Noel that question. The second option is if you raise your hand up to screen, if your video camera is on, um, I will then invite you to ask your question to Noel then again. Uh, please obviously be patient with me. Um, I want to make sure that everybody gets the opportunity to ask a question if they have one. So, Noel, thank you for joining us this morning. It's a it's great a pleasure. pleasure. Um, it's all mine. No, thank you. And uh, basically, to start the podcast, I'd like you to just quickly give a brief introduction of what sport you participated in um, during your sporting career. Okay. Okay, so first of all, morning everybody. Thanks very much for taking time out of your Friday to um, listen to the, the podcast. I think it's a great series. We've got some great people coming up as well. Hannah was brilliant and there's some other fantastic guests. So be sure to tune into those. Um, I um, competed in track and field, so athletics, from uh, my first Europeans in 1983 um, through to my final Europeans of 2005, so a 22 year career including six Paralympic Games um, in which I won a total of five gold medals from distances ranging from 800 up to 10,000 meters. A um, few other medals along the way. Um, um, just fa a fantastic time in my life where I got to do what I loved with people I love being with so looking back absolutely no regrets. Fantastic, Noel. So you've just mentioned, obviously, some of your accolades and the achievements and, you know, some of the competitions that you competed in. But could you explain to our listeners how you first became involved in athletics? And, you know, what did you love about that sport most? Uh -huh. Okay. So, first of all, I probably should explain my visual impairments. I was born with optic atrophy, so it's a congenital defect affecting that. The cells of the retina and optic nerve which didn't develop fully. Um, I went to a mainstream primary school until I was 10 and you know, talking to my parents I had some real frustrations there you know from not being able to see the blackboard and, and you know really 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 struggled. It wasn't you know we did a little bit of sport at school but when it came time to do cricket or anything involving I you know I never seen the ball could never hit the ball and I never had any real sense that, that was because I had a visual impairment. I just thought naturally I was really bad at those sports, but had absolutely no interest in sport. We did spend a lot of time outdoors. So during the holidays, I was either living, uh, going back to stay with my grandparents in Lincolnshire and they were out in the countryside, so I'd run around, or my uh, family were quite active and we'd go mountaineering or canoeing. So I was, I was definitely physically active, which I think probably laid the foundations for what was to come. But when I, I was 10, my parents took the decision to send me to Exor Grange School, which at the time was um, you know, 300, um, 300 pupils, uh, 200 boys, 100 girls, all with visual impairments and some with um, multiple impairments and disabilities. And that's where running became, came into my life. I didn't choose it by any you know, means at that point. So we had to, part of the Exor philosophy, um, Sort of as sort of determined by the headmaster George Marshall, he won an OBE for his um, innovative approach to education for children with a visual impairment. Part of the school philosophy was to get us active, and for us in our in, in Warwick House, which is a house of fifty boys, we had to go out running three times a week. So this was like rain, snow, hail, you know, whatever the weather. We we go out in our school issue black plimsolls and shorts and a tiny sort of vest and, and run two miles or so, so about three k, two laps of the school. And I absolutely hated it. So it was like torture to me. I was couldn't think of anything worse. It's traumatic enough to go to boarding school when you're ten years old and leave family and friends, and you know, be in a dormitory with five other boys and then to be forced to go out you know, running three times a week. This is the stuff of Dickens, you know, it really was pretty horrific for me. Um, 
to cut a very long story short, when I was 13, I got to the point where I disliked this so much that when one of my friends suggested we go off and try a cigarette, you know, and instead of going for a run, I jumped at the chance. We went up to this disused rail railway siding and sat in this little um, hut place and had one cigarette. And it, this teacher's got a little bit suspicious when 90 minutes after we left for this run, we still hadn't come back. So when we finally sort of go back to school, um, teacher smelt our breath, realised we'd got we'd been smoking, and the punishment for this was to be sent out running every night um, for a month to do five miles around the the, the, the mining villages in uh, on the edge of Coventry and Bedworth. Um, and it was after this kind of intensive Kenyan training camp um, that I went back to uh, school cross country, and where up to that point I'd probably finished last or second to last, I actually finished third. Teachers gave me some, you know, I got a lot of praise from the teachers. I got a lot of sort of kudos from my friends. And that's, that's how it started. Wow, that's incredible, Noel. So essentially being a, a little bit rogue in a certain incident, it's uh, led to a lot of your success, really, which uh, takes us on to our next question, which is, you know, when did you first realise that you had the potential to become an elite level runner it, I was talking to someone on a, on a podcast last Saturday and actually on reflection I, I, I started winning medals at the vis visually impaired um, schools going so at the time we had a number of meetings we'd go to and down in London and I remember winning some medals there in 100 and 200 and, and I think even in the long jump but that was just a bit of fun you know it's just another school sports outing it was really when I was 17 one of my friends a year above at Exor Robbie Latham convinced me to go down to the, um, to the I think it was the Metro Games actually, um, at Harringay in North London. And um, a total surprise to me, I've been active. We, we, we do athletics pretty much every night of the, of the summer term at Exor. You know, so we'd go out and we'd, we'd chase points in the three, hour, three A's um, five star award scheme, which was a scheme where you'd win points um, for particular performances. So, you know, if you won, uh, yeah, you ran 100 metres in 13 seconds, you get a certain number of points, and if you ran 12 seconds, you get more points. And we chased these these badges that you could sew onto your track seats, you know, um, and five stars was the sort of the top award. And what we try and do is we try and get um, the, next year, the next year's five star or two years, you know, so there's a lot of that sort of casual competition, you know, sort of friendly competition amongst the students at Exor. But Robbie persuaded me to go back, go down to, to Metro. And I remember doing the 400 and had absolutely no sense at all how to run 400 meters. So I just hammered it for as long as I could. And then till my body virtually sort of gave in on me at about 300 meters. And I crawled and swam in this sea of lactic acid through to the finish line. And as I was lying on the track, heaving and panting, you know, with the, the sky bright red because of all the blood rushing around my head, this, this guy, you know, came over to me and, looked down and then said oh you run like a wild animal laddie but i think with some coaching you could be you could be a great runner and it turns out that this uh gentleman's name was john anderson um and he was the coach to dave moorcroft who at that point was the world record holder for 5,000 meters able body um and robbie had been doing some training with john's group and john persuaded me to go along and it was john training with john's group that that got me you know that was my first serious sort of training group my first sort of exposure to elite level athletics and i said to someone again last week that you know at 16 years old 17 years old rather to have your first you know, to have dave moorcroft in your first training group it's an incredible incredible opportunity i probably didn't realize it at the time but when the best person in the group is the world record holder you and no one's really talking about your visual impairment as a, as a barrier to you performing you naturally assume that you can be as good as other people you know, I don't think I was any. So we'd train, um, we'd, we'd all pile in a minibus at John's house and we'd travel up to Perry Barring in Birmingham. And, you know, that, that bus would, con uh, you know, the people in that bus would include Judy Simpson, who was a Commonwealth heptathlon champion, a um, host of guys who'd run sub four minutes for a mile. We'd go to Birmingham and the track would be full, 300, 400 people all sort of flying around. And Birch was a phenomenally strong club team. So, you know, this is the halcyon days of athletics. I was just surrounded by an incredible number of really good athletes. So I went to the, my first Europeans when I was 17, and that was in Bulgaria, won a silver medal, and so disappointed in myself because Robbie and also one of my other good friends from Exor, uh, Mark Whiteley, they both won golds. 
So my silver compared to their gold, so I was just like, this is, you know, I completely let myself down. I threw the medal across the room, went off in a big huff. And, and even, I think, the next year I did my first Paralympics in, in New York, and even there, again, won a silver. I really hadn't got to the point where I was taking athletics seriously. It would, certainly wasn't on, on my radar as a, as a career, if you want. It was, you know, I was really enjoying it, but I was traveling around the world with my mates, we are having some fun, we were being physical, physically active, you know, we were taking on teams from other countries as, in that sort of sense of competition. But as far as, you know, looking at myself as, a, as an elite athlete, that came a long way down the line, I think. He, possibly Seoul 1988, where that was the first time that the Paralympic Games were held in the same venue as the Olympic Games. And I remember being in the Olympic Stadium there and you know, looking around and it was pretty empty. But, you know, it's a stadium that, 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 that held, you know, had a capacity of like 80,000 people. So to be there, you know, at, in the Olympic venue, you know, in Korea, you know, thousands of miles from home, there was that kind of sense that we were sort of coming of age. So it, it took a long while to really identify myself as an, as a, an elite athlete. Um, and it kind of just kind of unfolded organically. That's absolutely incredible. Uh, you, know, you know, a lot of athletes themselves tend to, you know, realise at a very young age, you know, they've got the potential to succeed at an elite level. Um, so what I would say, here. sorry, what I would say is I think, this is largely, I, mean, I can credit John and uh, John, John's group and the athletes around me because everybody was very humble. You know, it's, you know, there were no big sort of flash cars or big flash, you know, sponsorship deals. You know, Dave was working as a teacher. Many of the athletes that we, I was training with were Olympians. But I remember going out for a, for a 10 miler in London with Pat Scammell, who was a 352 miler who'd made the Olympics. And, um, you know, going back to his digs in London and he was sleeping on a mattress in the, in the room, in this sort of attic room in London. And after I had 10 miles, this is the first 10 miles I ever did, we had to climb out the skylight of his, of his <laughs> with our towels wrapped around us, edge your way across the roof of this building in central London. Yeah, perfect for a visually impaired person. Climb through this other window into someone else's room and have a shower there and then you could do the whole thing in reverse. You know, and this, this is the kind of lifestyle of the elite athlete. So, you know, as a young guy, this is all great fun you know we but there was no sense of you know like the, the current status of Paralympians you know <laughs> the, the support that they that they enjoy the sort of, you know the professionalism of the of the system around them that that was that was not a thing back in those days you know we were <laughs> we were living the dreams the proper you know old school approach yeah that's brilliant it's almost a combination of amateur and elite sport brought together there yeah the best of the amateur the best of the amateur side yeah um, so our next question, Noel, comes from Alex um, from British Blind Sport. So if I just hand over to Alex and she'll fire away with her question. Hi, Noel. Thanks for joining us. Um, I've just got a question, actually. It's a question that we've had asked to us a lot of the time. Um, obviously, a lot of athletes at the moment, they're, um, they're, they're unable to continue their training or continue their sport in the current uh, climate, particularly with guide running as well. We've had a lot of questions around when people can return to guide running. Um, have you got any tips or recommendations to those people to stay active both physically and mentally during these tough times? It's really tough if you're totally blind or you know your sight is a, a, at a level where you are dependent on someone else to, to help you run. And I saw some people will be able to, to train with guides. I think the whole thing about COVID for a visually impaired person was that our entire physical environment changed and being isolated is very, very much, you know, harder, I think, for some people who depend on other, other people. So mentally as well as physically, it becomes really important for us to do things like this and, and connect with each other and support each other through that process. So in terms of 
motivation. I, I, w- I'm, I was really lucky. I mean, I don't really run a lot now. I've been injured for a year and it's been a bit of a struggle, but for, I've got a uh, son who's just about to turn nine. And it became really important for me to keep him active. And through that process, we started walking and, and walk jogging and, and going on longer, longer walks and got to the stage where he was actually, I was able to do a bit more running and he was out on his scooter and I'd be jogging alongside him and he's running, going along and please maintain social distancing around my dad. He can't see very well. So we kind of, you know, I think trying to find the fun in sport and fun in, in activity is really important. You know, I think as, as an athlete, you can always do something at home. You know, I think some of the, Wheelchair athletes did a brilliant job of, of doing like a virtual Boston Marathon where I think they did it on Zoom where they got on their rollers and stuff. There's, there's things that you can do to interact as, um, with, your, with, with your friends and with other active people. And I know um, British Blind Sport have been putting links to sort of online physical sort of activity sessions. So things like that maintain some, some kind of sense of, you know, it, just, just moving makes you feel better. It's great for your mood. You know, if you're investing at all in, in, you know, in your physical health, you're probably helping your mental health. I think the other thing is just not to beat yourself up if you can't train. So, you know, someone on an elite program, just doing what you can, I think is really important. You know, for the elite athletes, particularly these days, it's, it's really hard work physically and mentally to maintain focus and concentration. And, you know, people who have been, you know, working towards Tokyo, very hard to see that opportunity disappear. But equally, it's not a bad thing every now and again to take a break, you know, take your foot off the gas, you know, invest some time in, in doing some other things that, you know, su- support you, um, you know, mentally as, as well as physically. But I think the most important thing is to stay connected. Brilliant. That's perfect. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for that question, Alex. Um, while we're on the subject of motivation, Noel, what did you used to do to stay motivated and continue pushing through some of those tough training sessions well that was it was pretty easy to be fair because as i said at the beginning i was training with dave's group and i could see these guys running you know 13 minute 5000 meters or four minute miles so there's always that sense i was kind of constantly chasing that you know and I, I had that belief from training with them that i should be able to produce similar performances now sadly in a lot of cases i didn't quite live up to what i thought i could do and um i was chatting to jared clifford who's the you know, the VI visually impaired at T12, current world um, 1500 meters and 5000 meters champion. And he's run 345 for 1500 meters and um, low 14 minutes for 5k. And actually just ran a time trial 29, 30, 10k on the track with his training group. So seeing, you know, what he, he did, that kind of validates my feeling that just because you have a visual impairment, you, sh- you, 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 you know, even if you have a visual impairment, sorry, you know, you can still strive to, to run faster and you know faster times and that was it really I'm a, I'm a huge you know track and field fan um and would constantly and, you know if i see someone a, a video of someone running or hear, hear a story of one of the you know the greats crammy co over a, a lot of people I, i've been lucky enough to meet um that's enough to get me out the door to be honest but that's that, that real sense of just wanting to challenge not you know not, not only my personal boundaries but also what people felt that someone with a visual imp- impairment could do and going back to Exel, i remember four of us going to the warwickshire schools cross country championships and actually winning that team team title which was you know four guys from a school you know uh, you know, for the visually impaired was an amazing achievement especially in the context of you know us going out and being teased by, by kids in the local community and we we're always you know this special school it was nice to sort of you know smash them and win that that title and and i think i don't want to sound too combative you know and or you know aggressive with a small lady but i think certainly it's really important you know personally to some to challenge yourself um and i've been lucky enough to be surrounded by people who you know could see my potential maybe sometimes see beyond my own feelings about my potential and and allow me to to achieve that's great Noel. i really think that's uh something that everyone should more, maybe like take on board great little bit of advice as well um so for the next part of our podcast i'd like to invite some of our uh, service users that are listening today to ask any questions so if you'd like to ask a question yeah, you can just raise your hand if your camera's on and I'll invite you to ask it or just feel free to ask Noel yourself right this second. Don't 
don't be shy folks no topic is off limits i think ryan is about to ask a question by yeah. the looks of things hi ryan yeah hi yeah hi everyone um my um my audio was going in and out so i'm not sure if you've mentioned this before um but i've joined today because uh, i work as a physio myself um and i'm currently doing a little bit of work uh, with my local hospital to try to get more visually impaired people um from school to like get interested in doing physio at university um i'm just wondering if you have any tips or any advice um in terms of how you coped at uni um in terms of clinical placements um and just independent study tips really i'm i'm partially sighted um and the people i've been speaking to have have sort of complete blindness or uh, slightly less vision than myself um so i wondered if you have any tips that's a great question first of all ryan uh, nice to meet you and um uh it's nice to talk to another physio <laughs> um, yeah. i was really lucky in a sense that i went to a school a physio college for specifically for the visually impaired and that that's called the uh, oh god north london school of physiotherapy <laughs> i forgot the name of the college um it's been a while it's been a while i'm really old mate um <laughs> so we everything was adapted for us so you know the entire library there, there were braille books i don't read braille but for those totally blind physios there were, you know text were in braille we had very small class numbers you know so about i think 12 in our year um into sadly only four people graduated so at the time we were doing sort of the grad deep dip uh, tp uh, physio qualification you know the csp's own um internal qualification mm -hmm. and you know i graduated with a distinction so I did two out of the other three and you know it, it was kind of a little bit looking back like survival of the fittest in that situation so i don't think it was a great testament to the to, to the to the kind of system at that point um in terms of uh, uh, of studying i mean now you know, lots and lots and lots of in online resources i mean it's never been easier to study as a physio wherever you are there's some amazing online resources the practical side of things you know there's a very good reason why i don't work in an itu you know <laughs> it's because you're visually impaired it's the scariest place on earth to be um, and during placements, um, it, it was quite challenging to get that across. You know, I can remember being on the surgical placement with another visually impaired guy. And, you know, you, we just had to kind of sink or swim. You know, it was really, really challenging and quite stressful experience. I always did my second Paralympics at the end of my um, second year. So in the summer holidays. And at that point, um, the college would threaten to sort of kick me off the course if I went to the Paralympic Games. It was only a sort of very... Um, strong conversation between my coach and and the college principal who was then head of the world society you know, physiotherapy association that actually got me on the plane to korea so i can't say that it was all plain sailing I, again i think you know you, you need some tenacity um to get through life anyway as a, someone with a visual impairment um i was lucky to have lots of support around me but the fact that only four out of the initial 12 got through it i think is probably not the best uh, testament to the system um you know manual side of things i think you know it's you can adapt teaching for people who have a visually impaired if you're a good educator you'll find a way of teaching someone anything it's the same with coaching uh, you know visually impaired athlete it's it's really it's possible to teach someone good techniques with you know if they even though they can't see and copy what you're doing you can explain that and it's a question of modifying that approach and i think you'll probably have experienced that that yourself i think there probably is an you know um a, a certain amount of responsibility on the visually impaired person to educate those people around so i think it might might be a little bit unrealistic to go into any situa situation um and, and expect everybody to understand the nature of your visually impairment so i think this needs to be a two-way process and a collaborative process where you know we educate those people around about what we can see and can't do and this is how it works with me at work and you know, i tell people that I, I, I need a little bit more time to write notes or you know now we've we've got to um you know disinfect everything after every patient so we need a little bit more time and not to cram things in because that's not only you know quite challenging and physically but it's also places you under additional stresses so a little bit more time and a little bit of creativity on the part of the educators is really important but i think the visually impaired student 
probably needs to be the person that actually initiates that conversation. So going into uni and expecting everything to automatically fall into place might be a, a bit unrealistic. Getting back to education, there's loads of stuff online now. You know, um, it's never been easier. And, then, and also there's a lot more willingness, I think, now. I spoke to a, a totally blind physio a few weeks ago who um, works in Essex, and, and he's doing all these assessments, you know, over the phone. And I thought, that's, that's a bit of creativity there. And it really made me think about my own practice and how I get information out of a patient with an assessment, you know, do, getting more out of, you know, the, our subjective assessment, the actual questioning, the interviewing side of the, of the assessment process. He taught me a few things that I hadn't actually thought about. It really made me focus a little bit more on that, which, you know, it's, I think that's something that even someone, a physio who's not visually impaired could learn from. Sorry, it's a really long-winded answer to quite a complicated question, so I hope that's helpful. No, that, that's great, thank you. I definitely sympathise with you on the, um, the ICU front. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's useful. I'll take that forward. Thanks for that. No worries, mate. Good luck. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that question, Ryan. Um, no, the next question that I have for you, it's sort of touching on some of those obstacles that you've had to overcome. So you mentioned about nearly being kicked off uh, your course uh, because you were going to go to the Paralympic Games. In terms of, you know, an obstacle that you've faced in your sport and career, what was the biggest one you've had to overcome? There have been a few. Um, I think injury is obviously the the big one for everybody and um having a stress fracture of my left tibia you know less than two months before the atlanta paralympics was probably the the biggest challenge you know looking back going into seoul in 1988 when i was at uni and i'd lo lost loads of weight because of all the stress surrounding that you know i had to get back and, and uh, into good shape with support of my friends that was quite challenging barcelona I, I put myself under so much pressure that i developed the paralysis of the fifth cranial nerve and developed bell's palsy um, if that's not paralysis of the fifth cranial nerve, Ryan, then um, I'm, I apologise for it. It's been a while. <laughs> but either way, I developed Bell's palsy. Atlanta with a stress fracture, that was, you know, that was a massive battle to get. You know, I was literally unable to run more than 10 metres about five weeks before the game, six weeks before the games. And had loads of, I was training in Japan, had loads of support in Japan, loads of support from the British Paralympic medical team when we got to, to Florida. Um, but, you know, that's as much a mental as a, as a physical barrier. I was absolutely determined to make the start line. You know, I would put a, my entire life on hold, got myself in quite a lot of debt to train in Japan, you know, really had to dig deep. But, you know, the result was, was two gold medals and probably my best championship. So I think, you know, turning those challenges into, into opportunities, sometimes that's when you find out the most about yourself. It would be nice for me to go to a championship or to have gone to a championship rather, and and sailed through and just been you know on a, on a wave of talent but it always seemed to be for me that i had to face some kind of difficulty in order to produce the best performances which yeah i <laughs> it's it's quite stressful but ultimately you know the, the results uh, weren't too bad thank you noel um so taking us on to our next question while we're sort of on this subject around sort of mental toughness and things i'd like to invite uh, serena to ask you her next question please hi um thanks firstly thank you so much for taking the time to um to talk with us today um so i'm currently a trainee sports psychologist um and i work a lot within um, inclusive sport um with bmx um, wheelchair tennis blind tennis um, and I, I'm always trying to be as inclusive as possible um, as a practitioner. And I was just wondering, do you have any advice or recommendations for sports psychologists so they could be more inclusive um, working with athletes with visual impairments? Wow. Okay. That's a great question, Terry. First of all, nice to meet you. Um, I never worked with a sports psych. I always shied away from working with a sports psych because I don't know. I kind of had, I think when I was, when I was young, and, and arrogant. I just thought I probably didn't need it. But looking back, I was also that little bit of, given some of the context around my medals, you know, that I've just sort of alluded to, you know, all the, the injuries and, and the stresses around there. I don't know, I, I probably would have done really well to talk to somebody. Um, I think athletes can be sometimes quite nervous around around opening about up about their their weaknesses and their fears and anxieties. But now we know that this is a huge issue in sport. You know, it's really important to talk to people and particularly as a visually impaired person, you know, there are, you know, 
whether you're an elite athlete or whether you're, you're just, you know, you just enjoy being active, or just you're a bit, any visually impaired person faces probably extra stresses and anxieties above those of their, you know, um, non-visually impaired peer group. Um, in, in terms of the approach on the part of the practitioner to the athlete, again, I think, I think it's, it's important that, that the visually impaired person be allowed to take some, you know, have, have autonomy um, and, and, and really the, the, the best advice I could give any practitioner, be it psychologist or, or indeed physio, just chatting to Ryan, is to you know, develop listening skills and communication skills appropriate to that, to that group. Uh, it, it, you know, talk to lots of visually impaired people about you know how life is how it is you know to train you know what it is to try and get access to a training facilities those additional challenges that you know they're facing on a day-to-day basis you know outside of the sporting or their sporting life which then impact on their sporting you know life and their enjoyment of sport and their ability to take part in sport so I think listening is super important you know developing different communication styles I think that may be appropriate um you know you can't use very sort of many vis- visual sort of triggers or cues or metaphors that you know with the vision impaired community but you know we're, we're we've pretty much had all the same experiences whether we're you know paralympians or whether, or not um so just talk to loads of people um get as much information as you possibly can from from the athletes you know everybody will be very different about in terms of the way that they see their their visual impairment and, and, and their willingness to talk about it but yeah listen to lots of people that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for your question, Serena. Uh, no, so while we're sort of on a little bit of the, the subject of, you know, the psychological side of, you know, sports, um, a lot of athletes have pre-race superstitions. So did you have any superstitions? And if so, what were they? I'm not sure I had any superstitions. I definitely had had routines. I wanted everything to happen at, at a particular time, and that's just so that you can rehearse things as as much as possible. It, it's quite important, actually, as an elite athlete, not to get too hung up on things because you know life has a habit of throwing curveballs at you, and in case of the injuries, etc., etc., etc. Even in the in the on you know the day of the competition, you know buses being late, things not being where you thought they were, etc., etc. That's that's quite challenging. You know we we need and, and and you need to be able to be responsive to that so i would be terrified the day before a competition so i remember in sydney sharing a house with tanny gray thompson and i wouldn't i couldn't speak to anybody and i couldn't eat anything and she'd be downstairs thrown up in the bathroom because she was so nervous and this is one of great britain's most successful para athletes you know we would be terrified and then on the day of competition strangely there'd be that real sense of calm you know you step out onto the track and it wasn't at all scary it's that, that feeling that you know this was somewhere you know you you were meant to be you know you were comfortable you know hours and hours and days and months and years of training around the track you know you used to being on the track the smell of the tartan you know um all, all of that was a very sort of comforting environment to be in and and a great opportunity to do you know to show you know, you know the, the people watching but people back home but you, you need to yourself you know what you could do so it's an opportunity to perform in, in, in a sense so no real super, i mean i yeah i'd like to have, have food at the same time i'd like to do certain things at the same time the warm-up you know everything needed to be you know very well re- Something I think you may have thrown uh, aspirations to sort of get back and yeah, two, three years ago, two years ago, I think I was ranked tenth in the country in you know across the board, not just BI athletes, as for my age group for a mile, having only done one race. So there's kind of that feeling that I can still still get back and, and enjoy running fast. Um, but I'm a full-time physiotherapist. I work at an independent hospital in northeast London where I treat um musculoskeletal um, pain um, patients, uh, rather. I am super busy outside that with, with family life. I've also, do, I'm doing lots of work with 
Japanese organizations, um, so Japan and Japanese Embassy in London, um, and Japan Sports Council, J uh, Japan Foundation, and British sports organizations like Paralympics GB, British Athletics, teaching Japanese. Um, so I spent a lot of time in Japan. I studied Japanese at London University, um, got native speaker equivalency there. Um, so that's big. I'm just about to start a podcast, um, the Japan Sports Stories podcast, which um, launches next Thursday. Um, on the day that the Olympic Games should have started. Um, so, yeah, life's, life's pretty busy. You know, I like to keep, you know, reinventing myself. Um, this has been great. I mean, during lockdown, I've, I've, I've managed to catch up with so many people I used to compete with. You know, we've had a few nostalgic evenings, look at back, at, back at some of our old, you know, performances. So um, I'm also, you know, really keen to, to still be involved in, in sport around visual impairment and, and help people who you know would like my help and in terms of either in terms of at grassroots level i do some work with with park run i'm a park run volunteer but also you know went out to japan when they launched park run in japan um so i think that's a really great vehicle for anybody who wants to get active you know park run has been amazing on so many fronts but for people who are visually impaired there couldn't possibly be a more supportive inclusive community in southport park run have lots of guide runners and, and vi runners there and as do other park runs around the country so if i've forgotten you know which park run apologies um so you know i'm, I'm trying to keep myself as active as possible pretty busy brilliant thank you thanks for that noel uh my next question comes from Tommy, who has uh, submitted a question in the chat. So I'd like to ask Tommy if he could uh, ask you your question, please, Noel. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, David. Um, it's great to hear you mention, um, mention park run as, as a way to sort of get active. I was wondering if you had any other training tips for sort of a young aspiring runner. Wow. Across the board. Um, Got to enjoy it. I mean, be, I mean, that's what I constantly tell my son. Um, you know, he does junior park run. Um, you know, to start with, it being enjoy, it being active, you need to enjoy what you're doing. It needs to be sustainable. You need to be around, you know, the right the right people. Which is why I love park run so much because you know it's non judgmental. It's all inclusive. It is all about. It's not about just about the run. You know, it's all about the community. Um, so you know, I think. That's 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 important. Obviously, if you're not a runner, then you know finding local um, local groups who support the sport you're doing. But I wouldn't get hung up on on technique or times really early on. You know, every every child's born with with the ability to run. Um, I, have to, I have to say, I once went out to, to 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 school for the blind in Miyazaki in Japan, where I met an 11 year old Japanese boy who'd never run never been given the opportunity to run and that was a real shock for me i mean when we tried we got this um steve brunt who is a paralympic gold medalist in the t12 marathon and i you know asked this boy to run with us and he said he didn't know how to run um and we said well, you must know how to run everybody every child runs he said no i've never been allowed to run and that was that was really quite a powerful moment you know to, to see someone who you know probably for all the with all the best intention just you know didn't want to fall over or you know hurt himself hadn't been given the opportunity to, to be physically active um i think it's super important that we don't place barriers that are not there you know park run is, is brilliant it's it's safe you know there are so many people willing to be guide runners out there i put on i tried to put on a, a mile for the visually impaired back in 2011 up in 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 leeds with with tom williams who's now tro park run we only had two or three people from the local vi community turn up but we had 30 people wanting to be guide runners so you know there are a lot of people out there very willing to to help don't be, don't be nervous about you know running you know it's it, you know you can take it slow you can you can walk a bit, walk a bit so my son is one of his friends and we mix it up, you know, we play games, we run up and down hills, we, you know, we, we don't try not to focus on times because, you know, it's, it's non-sustainable. You know, the, the reason I started running is because <laughs> after, after the punishment stage, um, the reason I continued running, maybe a better, better way of start, starting this answer, was because it's, it, you know, I love being outside and I love just the feelings of ground moving underneath my feet. And I like being in different places and I like 
and I like meet, meeting other runners. Um, and that's why I still run. That's why I still want to get back to running. That's such a great message. Thanks, Noel. It's a pleasure, Tommy. Good luck. Thank you for your question, Tommy. Uh, Noel, the final question from me before I open up to the rest of our listeners um, is, you know, you've won five Paralympic gold medals. You've broken a world record. You've been awarded an MBE. What would you say, in your opinion, is your biggest achievement during your sporting career or throughout life? Other than us winning the Warwickshire Schools Cross Country Championship. Um, that's a high. That's definitely a highlight. Um, any, anybody out there getting a hard time from people around them because they're machine impaired, you know, hang on to that story, folks. Um, oh, any of those, any of those performances. So I, I was, the, the records are always going to get broken. I mean, something that happened recently, which I thought was really special, was last, last weekend, last Sunday, I got interviewed by Jared Clifford, who's the, the current world you know, champion, T12, 15, 5K. So, you know, it was, it was the new generation interviewing me, the old generation, and, and seeing him achieve what he's doing. And you have that can-do attitude from, from, you know, surround yourself with positive people. Then, then we can all do, you know, things way beyond our... our what we think is is possible if i had to pick out a performance i think winning the 1500 meters in barcelona in front of the spanish crowd beating two spaniards that was really special that was an incredible race um atlanta two goals with with a stress fracture um and then sydney i think you know the the, the final paralympic goal in the 5000 meters there having blown the 10,000 meters just by lap through running really badly and then coming back and not only winning the gold, but running all, you know, but the first 100 metres in the lead. So pretty much gun to tape, breaking 15 minute barrier, which, and setting a new world record. That's going to be the performance that stands out. And the thing, the reason it stands out is not just, you know, the, the time and, and you know, the world record and the gold medal, but because all my mates were on the, on the finishing line to see it happen and to see how happy they were was was just amazing so that's going to be one that's the performance that I, I think probably defines my running career um carrying the flag for the team in athens again and an just huge emotional moment for me to, to be selected or chosen by your peers to particularly the gb para olympic team you know paralympics gb has so many amazing athletes each and every one of them you know not only just incredible athletes but all you know with incredible life stories and to be asked to buy them to represent them on the greatest stage i think yeah that's that that's a huge a huge huge honor and on a par with any medal winning performances stepping out into the stadium with my guide runner you know um and that is that my guide at the time rob dewhurst you know committed huge amounts of his own time to supporting me and and you know we need to be you know thankful for those people around us that help us achieve what we did because without the guide runners i wouldn't have won any medals without the coaches i wouldn't have won any medals without my parents my family my wife and my son i wouldn't have won what i was able to to win so and without bridge blind sport you know guys we were we were coming down to bridge bbs championships you know year on year it was a highlight of our athletic um year when we were when we were at school and in my early sort of developmental years and um it was it was huge to win you know a, a, a medal there and, and be around our friends and you know so i owe a huge debt of gratitude to british blind sports so thank you guys thank you Noel. some really inspiring messages there you know when you talk about your friends being there you know when you broke the world record and were awarded that gold medal that sort of to me captures what sport is having your yeah, friends yeah. around um yeah definitely and i was lucky enough to for most of my career to be in the you know the para endurance squad you know we were just we were good mates you know we were traveling the world we were winning medals and breaking records and trying to trash ourselves in training um but it was all good fun and we were all part of you know we were, we were more than teammates um you know those friendships last forever yeah, brilliant um i would just like to finally thank everybody for listening today and if you do have any questions for noel um, 
you can always email them over to me at david at britishblindsports.org.uk and I'll do my best to pass those on to Noel. Um, and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer your questions. So yeah, thank absolutely. You. Yeah, I was going to say, or you can just um, get me at Noel Thatcher on, on Twitter um, and uh, yeah, or send me a message, get in touch. I do do Facebook a little bit, but probably Twitter's the best platform to, to catch up with me. That's where I'm, I'm most active. But thank you very much for taking the time out of your Friday. It's been a pleasure. It's been a great, I mean, I've really enjoyed the interview, David, been some fresh questions and some fresh approaches. So thank you very much. No, thank you, Noel. It's all our pleasure. And uh, for those that would like to tune into our next episode of the Paralympic Podcast, we'll be having Roy Turnham joining us on Friday the 31st of July. So thank you very much, everybody. And I hope you're all well. And thanks again, Noel. You've been brilliant. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend.